If you're a large family and you'd like to be able to carry six, seven, or eight people in relative comfort and their luggage for a weekend away, you could try and squeeze everybody in a minivan, but they'd need to pack very, very light. The average three row crossover, even a large one, just wouldn't be up to the task. You could of course get a full size van or you could get something like this very large 2016 GMC Yukon Denali. The Chevrolet Tahoe and Suburban, the GMC Yukon and Yukon XL, and the Cadillac Escalade are all very closely related. The long wheelbase versions of these full-size SUVs are also some of the largest vehicles sold in the United States. You've probably heard the terms unibody and body on frame before, but what do they really mean? This is a body on frame SUV. Something like a Dodge Durango is a unibody SUV. The difference is that what you're taking a look at here on the outside is the body of the vehicle. And that's the sheet metal that we're seeing right here, the cabin, etc. That's all the body of the vehicle. Then there's a separate frame in the vehicle. The frame carries the suspension, front and rear, the engine, the drivetrain, etc., the fuel tank, all of that is in a frame that's separate from the body. It lives right down here, right about the running board level in the vehicle. Generally speaking, because the body and the frame are two separate items, body on frame SUVs have higher towing capacities than we find in unibody vehicles. They can make that frame very, very beefy and they can also change it from one version of the vehicle to another without changing the body on top. The downside to a body on frame design is space efficiency. And that's obvious when you compare something like the short wheelbase Yukon to something like a Dodge Durango. The Durango looks like it's a little bit smaller on the outside and a little bit shorter, and it actually is, but it's about the same size on the inside as you find a traditional body on frame SUV. If you're thinking to yourself, this GMC looks awfully large, then your eyes are not deceiving you. It is a very, very large vehicle. This is nine inches wider than a Toyota Camry, and it really feels like it on the inside of the cabin. We have this enormous grill here, which is used for cooling because we do have a large V8 engine under the hood. We also have the ability to tow over four tons in all of these full-size SUVs from General Motors. As I said before, this SUV comes in two different lengths. One is 204 inches long, which is already extremely long for the United States. This model is 224 inches long. It adds nearly two feet. The easy way to tell the two apart is this rear window glass. It is significantly larger in the stretched version. The stretch goes not just to the cargo area in the back where we get a significantly larger cargo area than the regular Yukon, but it also goes to the third row where we get about eight inches more rear legroom than we get in the other versions. This means that we have the most rear legroom and most combined legroom in any three row SUV in this particular model. It should be pretty obvious that we also get a decent amount of headroom in the back because the roof line does stay very square all the way to the rear. The back end design is imposing yet practical. So we get this very vertical hatch in the back. We get these LED tail lamp modules on either side that don't move on over into the tailgate. We also get one of the few vehicles left with a separately opening glass. So you can open this section of the tailgate. You'll notice that the windshield wiper is hidden right here in this section underneath the spoiler so you don't see it from the outside. And of course you can also open this entire hatch all by itself. This portion of the rear bumper is normally hidden by a cover that is painted to match the body of the vehicle, and it hides the hitch receiver as well as the wiring harness connector for your trailer. Depending on the model you get, you'll find one of two different engines under the hood. There's a 5.3 liter V8 engine or a 6.2 liter V8 engine. The 5.3 produces 355 horsepower and the 6.2 that we're taking a look at right here produces 420 horsepower and 460 pound-feet of torque. As you'd expect from a large SUV like this, rear wheel drive is standard, although you can option up into a traditional transfer case style four wheel drive system. If you opt for the 6.2 liter V8 engine, then you get a two speed transfer case. If you get the 5.3 liter V8, then you get a single speed transfer case. Also different between the engines, this 6.2 liter V8 engine is now mated to a new eight speed automatic transmission. The 5.3 still gets the old six speed. Fuel economy is obviously not going to be as high as your average Camry or Accord because we are talking about a 6,000 pound SUV with a large V8 engine under the hood. However, GM has done everything that they can to try and make this V8 as modern and as fuel efficient as possible. This engine has variable cylinder management, so it can deactivate four cylinders and operate as essentially a four cylinder engine on the highway. It also has direct injection and variable valve timing, even though it is still a pushrod V8 engine. It's actually quite a modern engine design. In the quest for improved fuel economy, Ford and General Motors went very different ways. GM decided to take their existing V8 engines and try and do everything they possibly could to improve fuel economy with all of these modern improvements to the engine. They also added an eight speed automatic transmission. 
Ford decided to downsize the engine to a 3.5 liter V6 engine and add turbos, but leave the six speed automatic. One of the other main reasons to buy a large SUV like this is the tow rating. When properly configured, a Yukon can tow up to 8,500 pounds, and that would be the short wheelbase version, and they all allow around 1,000 pounds of tongue weight, which is fairly high. I found front seat comfort to be excellent in all trims of the Yukon. Our Denali trim has a power tilt telescopic steering column, power pedals, two position seat memory right over there, four-way adjustable lumbar support, and a power adjustable driver and front passenger seat. One nice touch here is that the front passenger seat, like we see in most GM vehicles, has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, and that's not something you see in especially the Japanese competition. Although this seat is as adjustable as we see in the Durango, I found this seat more comfortable because it definitely is more softly padded. The one in the Durango tends to be a little bit too hard for my tastes. When it comes to second row comfort, I'm gonna give these seats nine out of 10 points. That might surprise you for a vehicle this size, but these captain's chairs do not slide forward and backward, although they do have a recline mechanism with a decent range of motion. That means that if I move over to the right side, where this front seat is all the way back in its tracks, I have only about two inches of legroom left here. That's not really more than you'll find in many mid-sized three-row crossovers. The model that we're taking a look is the seven passenger variety, so there's nothing right here in the middle. However, because of the width of the Yukon, you can very easily walk from the second row into the third row. The other way to get into the third row is to flip and fold the second row seat. You can either do it manually like I'm doing right here, or you can do it powered from either the back of the vehicle or a button right here on the side. We're now starting to see one of the areas where the Denali is definitely larger than your average three-row crossover because this area right here is definitely wider than we see in something like a Nissan Pathfinder. It's easy to see why these vehicles are very frequently used as hotel shuttles, airport shuttles, etc. because the dimensions of this third row are very different from your average three-row crossover. I'm not just talking about the fact that I have about two inches of headroom sitting in the middle seat. I'm also talking about the fact that you could actually put two adults on either side of me in this third row seat in moderate comfort. The reason for that is that this bench seat is considerably wider than your average three row crossover. You can fit a four by eight sheet of plywood in this vehicle from the backs of those front seats and still close the rear hatch completely between the rear wheel wells. Now we are of course in the extended wheelbase version which means that I get even more legroom in this third row. That means that even though the second row seat is fixed into place sitting in this third row, I have about two inches of legroom left right there. Helping make your six children just a little bit happier in the back, we actually have two rows of LCD screens. We have one right here for the third row, and then we have a second one right here for the second row. Obviously, the other reason that these vehicles are so popular with transport services is how many suitcases you can fit in the back. In our new suitcase test, we very easily fit eight suitcases in this upright position. As you can see, double the, you can see there's actually a second row right back there of these 24 inch hard-sided suitcases. When it came time to calculate our new luggage score, it was obvious that we need to buy more suitcases because we were able to fit 10 of these bags right back here. You can actually fit a ninth one right here behind this front row. So only four right here, but actually five right behind it. And then you can squish one right on top if you're very careful. The extended wheelbase version of the Yukon shares some of the stretch with the third row, but a lot of it goes right back here to the rear cargo area. Oddly enough, that means that the average minivan is actually a little bit more cargo practical than the short wheelbase version of the Yukon. However, nothing matches this long wheelbase version. Thanks to a positively enormous cargo area, the ability to fit four by eight sheets of things inside this vehicle and still close the hatch, some additional storage space right here under the cargo load floor, and of course, a spare tire, this easily scores 10 out of 10 points. We also have a power lift gate with a button right over here somewhere. One of the interesting differences between this and something like the Ford Expedition Platinum is that you actually find real wood trim inside the Denali. So real wood trim is not relegated just to Cadillac in the General Motors lineup. Keeping in mind that although this tester does cost $80,000, the base versions of the Yukon start around $48,000. So we still find some hard plastics on the door. This upper portion where your arm would naturally rest right there on the windowsill, that's a soft touch plastic. We have a soft touch insert right here and a soft touch armrest. Of course, again, that real wood trim. But the other brown portion, which connects those two areas and also forms this lower portion of the door, that's all a hard touch plastic. We have a lot of storage going on right here. We actually have a storage cubby right there under the armrest and then one again lower in the door right by that speaker grill. It's very hard to see from this camera angle, but it's right down there. 
In addition to the real wood trim, we also find real aluminum trim inside this cabin. And that's right here between the soft touch injection molded upper portion of the dashboard and this soft touch stitched portion of the dashboard. We do have a fairly small glove compartment lower in the dashboard, which is a little surprising for a vehicle this size. Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we find more of this real aluminum trim. It does have a much more premium feel to it than some of the imitation trims that we see in other vehicles in the segment. We have a standard touchscreen LCD right here in the center of the dashboard. A big change for 2016 is that we now have Apple CarPlay and Android Auto support right inside this touchscreen, which actually makes the navigation software a little bit less important in my book. Like other GM vehicles, the screen has a trick up its sleeve. We press a little button right there, the screen lifts up and out of the way to reveal a fairly large storage cubby right back there with a USB input. In fact, this system has five USB inputs, which is very unusual in this segment. I'm not just talking about USB ports because some of the competition have charge only USB ports. This system has five USB ports, period. All of those ports are accessible. You can actually plug in five different audio devices connect them all to the system and interact with them. If you want to know more about this infotainment system, go ahead and click that banner at the bottom of your screen. You'll be taken on over to a review of this software in a different vehicle. Below the screen, we have a limited number of buttons and knobs to control that system. Volume and power right over here, a scroll and menu knob, direct access to radio, media, the button that opens and closes that screen right there. Track forward, backward, eject button for the single slot optical disc player right down here, a back button and a home button. Continuing on down, we find the controls for our Tri-Zone Automatic Climate Control that is also standard in the Yukon and also a point of differentiation. So we have controls for the right and left side, and then controls for the rear climate control separately from that. Our model does have, again, the heated and ventilated seats, so we find controls for those on each side. If you hadn't realized it yet, the center console in the Yukon is incredibly wide. We have a storage cubby right here with a closable lid, and this is where you'll find two of the five USB ports and a 12-volt power outlet. Behind that, we have another area right here with a closable lid, and this is where you'll find two very large cup holders. In the middle of this very wide center console lid, we find an optional wireless charging mat. iPhone 6s don't support that, but there are a wide variety of Android phones that do. Opening the lid, we find an incredibly large storage area. This is wide enough that you can actually put letter-sized hanging files. That's what these two ridges right here on each side are actually for, so you can actually hang those hanging folders right in there. We have a light, we have two more USB inputs, some little storage cubbies right here, and another 12-volt power outlet. On each side of the center console, we find more real wood trim, and then below that, we find small storage cubbies that run almost the length of that center console. Over on the dashboard, we find an instrument cluster that's very similar to GM's pickup truck. So we have a large tachometer on the left, speedometer on the right, and then everything else that you're seeing is part of this large 7-inch LCD in the middle. The LCD is controlled via this four-way joystick with OK button on the right side of the steering wheel. The infotainment and center display software is very closely related to Cadillac's Q, and so it operates in a very similar form. We have a few different skins. We have this technology skin. Skins change also if you put the vehicle in the tow haul mode. So right now I'm going to engage tow haul. You'll see that we get two extra gauges in that particular display. There's also a media view, which is a little bit different. And again, if I engage tow haul, we get some additional gauges popping up on the screen. Back on the standard theme, you notice we have voltage on the right side of this display, but if I engage tow haul, that swaps that out for a transmission temperature gauge. This display also houses your typical trip computer information, speed limit information, trailer gain, off-road information right there, engine hours, fuel economy, that sort of thing. You can use this display to change your input method. We can go from AM, FM, Sirius satellite radio, your various Bluetooth interfaces, media files, etc. There's also a dedicated phone interface and a navigation interface which would give you turn-by-turn -turn directions and a very small map right there in the center. The steering wheel design is very similar to GM's pickup trucks. We have a large central airbag right here. It's a four-spoke design, and we have real aluminum trim on each side. As I said in the engine section, the four-wheel drive system that we have in the Yukon, the Suburban, the Tahoe, etc., is a traditional truck-style transfer case four-wheel drive system. That means that we have a center coupling basically right here under the center console. It can connect or disconnect the front wheels to the rear wheels. It's a permanent connection. So when you're using this in the four high mode or even the four load that's optional in this particular vehicle, then you should only be using it on loose surfaces like we're on right here. Dirt, gravel, mud, that sort of thing. As I said earlier, the extended wheelbase Denali that we're driving right here weighs 6,000 pounds. That's about the same kind of curb weight as two Audi A3 sedans. 
However, when it came time to test zero to 60, we still scored 5.9 seconds, which is very impressive for a vehicle this size. You can thank this massive V8 engine under the hood and the eight speed automatic transmission. The eight speed automatic transmission that's new for this year actually shaved three tenths of a second off the zero to 60 time versus the last Denali we tested with the same engine, but the six speed automatic. The new transmission design allows the Denali to tie with the Dodge Durango V8 for the fastest entry in this segment in our tests. The nature of the Yukon is a little bit surprising because GM has programmed the throttle to be very ginger down there at the beginning of its travel. That means that when you first get behind the wheel, it feels perhaps a little bit slow. However, if you really romp on the pedal, again, you'll go from zero to 60 in under six seconds. The steering effort is moderate and the rack is very precise. This goes exactly where you point it. And there aren't as many turns lock to lock as you might assume in a large vehicle like this. The interesting thing about this vehicle is that the more you drive it, the more you realize how small it actually drives. I mean, I am driving a living room on wheels. We can have seating for eight people in the back. We have an incredible amount of cargo room back there. You can jam tons of suitcases in the back, but this actually drives like a much smaller vehicle. The turning radius is not as bad as you might think for something that's this large. You can actually make U-turns in average suburban settings. The zero to 60 time is on par with V6 family sedans. Perhaps more surprising is that this Yukon managed to stop from 60 to zero almost as fast as the average V6 family sedan as well. We ran from 60 to zero in 139 feet, so I'm gonna give this a B. Now you may wonder why it's not an A. The reason for that is brake fade, because after four or five back-to-back -back stops, the brakes are definitely starting to fade and the distance really starts dragging out after that. However, the initial panic stop, as long as you're not beating on your Yukon or trying to drag race at something like that, initial panic stops on the freeway, on mountain roads, etc trying to avoid that accident. The Yukon does incredibly well for itself thanks to very, very wide tires and an excellently designed suspension. The model that we've been driving has the optional 22 inch wheels and tires, and they're an option that I think I might skip. They do have a very slight positive effect on handling. However, the ride does take a toll and I'm gonna have to drop the ride down to a B. It definitely gets an A without these wheels and tires, however. There's just not as much sidewall on these tires to help cushion the ride on bumpy roads, gravel roads like we're on right here back out on an asphalt road, you can definitely still feel the road imperfections thanks again to these 22 inch wheels and tires. The suspension is also a little bit firmer than you might think a full size SUV like this would be. The Denali trim is one of the quietest full size SUVs we have ever tested. And in fact, it's one of the quietest vehicles we have ever tested, period. Cabin noise came in at 67 and a half decibels, which is quieter than something like a BMW X5. Fuel economy is a tricky thing to talk about. Some of you on Facebook were questioning how I could be impressed by a 16 to 16 and a half mile per gallon score in a vehicle like this. The reality is that 16 miles per gallon in a vehicle with a 6.2 liter V8 engine that produces 420 horsepower goes zero to 60 in under six seconds, can tow over 4,000 pounds and weighs itself over three tons is very impressive. In fact, if you actually take a look at this as far as fuel economy for pound moved, then this is just about as efficient as a 30 mile per gallon midsize sedan. When it comes to fuel economy, some people forget that a one to two mile per gallon jump at this end of the scale is actually gonna save your pocketbook more money than one to two miles per gallon on top of something like a Toyota Prius. So going from 14 to 16 miles per gallon is gonna save you an awful lot more money than going from 50 to 52 miles per gallon, for instance. That also means, however, that the Dodge Durango is going to be one of the least expensive to operate in this segment. The V6 two-wheel drive version of the Dodge will get around 19 miles per gallon, and that's gonna be a significant savings over something like this Yukon. It's, of course, not gonna be as large as the model we're driving. In theory, the Yukon is just a semi-step above the Tahoe in base form, although the Tahoe does not have a Denali level trim like we do see in the GMC. The model that we've been taking a look at is an essentially fully loaded four wheel drive long wheelbase model and that came in at $80,650 because this model has everything including all wheel drive, the heads up display, sunroof, rear seat entertainment, the optional 22 inch wheels, the running boards, the radar cruise control, the alarm system, and a very large destination charge of $1,195. Let's start out our competitive segment by talking about engines. The engines available in the Yukon are the 5.3 liter V8 engine and the 6.2 liter V8 engine, as I said earlier. Things are a little bit different over with the Ford Expedition, because very recently Ford decided to kill their V8 engine. The only engine offered in that vehicle now is a 3.5 liter twin turbo V6. It produces 365 horsepower and 420 pound-feet of torque 
It's mated to a six-speed automatic transmission only. The Nissan Armada is probably using one of the oldest and thirstiest engines in this segment. It's a 5.6 liter V8 engine. Importantly, it is not the same 5.6 that we see in the Infiniti QX80. This is actually the older engine. The Dodge Durango, which I suppose is a direct competitor to most trims of the Yukon, is also unique in this segment because it starts with a naturally aspirated V6 engine. Towing is obviously one of the main reasons to buy large SUVs like this. The Yukon can tow up to 8,500 pounds if you get the short wheelbase version. Regardless of which wheelbase you get, however, the 6.2 liter V8 engine does a better job towing the load because we get more power and we get the eight speed automatic transmission. Remember that when towing, it's not just about towing capacity, it's also about the way the vehicle tows. Because of the long wheelbase that we've had in our test model, it tows a large heavy trailer much better than the average entry in this segment actually. The longer the vehicle that you get, the heavier the vehicle that you get, generally the more competent it is when towing, it's gonna feel a little bit less like the trailer is trying to tow you, more like you're trying to tow the trailer. Obviously that really just applies to the long wheelbase version. If we're talking about the short wheelbase version of the Yukon, it's fairly comparable to the Ford Expedition. Speaking of the Ford Expedition, it does top out this segment with up to 9,200 pounds of towing capacity. You'll see relatively smaller numbers in something like the Toyota Sequoia, or the Dodge Durango. Those will only tow up to 7,400 pounds. High towing capacities don't come free and the toll to be paid is fuel economy. The Dodge Durango is the most efficient vehicle in this segment. The Armada and the Sequoia are the least efficient, averaging between 14 and 15 miles per gallon combined on the current EPA cycle. As you can see on the side of your screen, the Expedition and the Yukon are quite similar when it comes to combined fuel economy, but as I said earlier, they get there in very different ways. The very different ways of getting there has an effect on towing. When you're towing, you'll actually get better fuel economy, in my experience, in the Yukon rather than the Expedition. When you're comparing the regular short wheelbase version of the Yukon, the Sequoia and the Expedition end up being very close in terms of overall price when you compare feature for feature. There is a slight premium to be paid for the Yukon because it is one of the newer entries in this particular segment. However, they're all going to be fairly close together. The Armada is going to be a decent discount over them, however, and the Durango is going to be considerably less expensive than a Yukon. The important thing to keep in mind when it comes to pricing is that there really is no corollary in any of these vehicles to the long wheelbase version that we have been driving. That would be the Suburban, the Yukon XL, or the long wheelbase version of the Denali. Now let's dive into the models more specifically. First up, we have the Dodge Durango. It's not as wide, but it's almost as long as the Yukon. It's definitely not as tall either. The reason for that, again, is that the Durango is really a unibody crossover vehicle Crossover technically is the hybrid between a truck-like vehicle and a car-like vehicle, and the Durango really does have aspects of both. We actually get more cargo capacity in the Durango than you get in the short wheelbase version of the Yukon. We get extremely good legroom and headroom figures in all the rows. In addition to being nearly a thousand pounds lighter, it also has a nearly perfect 50-50 weight balance. Next up, we have the Nissan Armada. The Armada is getting really old at this point, and it really shows on the inside and on the outside of the vehicle. The outside is starting to look a little bit less like Nissan's current product line, and on the inside we have their last generation infotainment systems. The Armada and the Sequoia also managed to get the lowest fuel economy ratings in this particular segment. The average family driving about 15,000 miles a year will spend about $600 less when they're driving the average Yukon versus the average Armada or Sequoia, and that's at today's current low gas prices. The Toyota Sequoia has proved to be quite reliable, but it's just not as modern as many of the entries in this particular segment. That really shows on the inside, on the outside, and under the hood. The Sequoia is also one of the thirstiest entries in this segment, as I said. Ford's Expedition is probably the most direct competitor to the mainstream versions of the Yukon. The Expedition is not as fresh, although it was updated recently with an LCD instrument cluster, and it now gets the latest SYNC 3 infotainment system. Again, the Expedition gets the Turbo V6 versus the V8s that we see in the GM models. The Expedition Platinum is really not quite a Denali. It lacks the external differentiation that we see in the Denali versus the regular Yukon. It also lacks luxury features like real wood trim, real aluminum trim, etc. It is going to be a little bit less expensive, however. A top-end version of the Expedition is going to top out at around $74,000. It is a decent discount versus top-end versions of the Denali. Another possible competitor could be the Mercedes-Benz GLS, although the GLS really targets the Escalade more than the Yukon Denali. 
Pricing wise, it definitely is more on the Escalade side than the Denali side, even though it starts at $67,050. The big thing to know about the Mercedes is that it gets fantastically expensive. That base version does use a twin turbo 3 liter V6 engine. If you want V8 engines in your GL, it's going to start costing you an awful lot more than any version of the GMC. Perhaps the most direct competitor for the Denali is the Infiniti QX80. It starts at $63,250. Again, however, there is no long wheelbase version, so this really just competes with the short wheelbase version of the Denali. Overall power figures, performance figures, cargo figures, and legroom figures are quite similar QX80 to the Denali. The QX80 also does not get as expensive as the other full-size luxury SUVs. In terms of overall build quality, the QX80 comes across as a little bit more luxurious. It's obvious that the interior was put together with a little bit more care, and the average parts quality in the cabin is definitely a little bit higher than we see in the Denali. If my money were on the line, the Durango would be my top pick in this segment. The Yukon would be number two. I like the way the Yukon looks just a little bit more than the Chevy Tahoe, although styling is more of a personal preference. I would definitely take the Yukon or the Tahoe over the other entries in the segment. It simply is newer, it's fresher, the V8 engines are quite efficient. In fact, I'm surprised how good the fuel economy has been in the long wheelbase Denali. 16 miles per gallon in a vehicle that is shaped like a brick and weighs this much that tows is actually a very impressive fuel economy figure. If you're looking for a vehicle that's somewhere between the mainstream entries and the luxury entries, then I would also get the Denali over something like the Infiniti QX80. I would also probably get it over a base Mercedes-Benz GLS. Mercedes-Benz GLS is very attractive in my book. I really like the way the interior is done, but for a similar price, you're not going to get the same kind of feature content that we see in the GM. It's going to have a little bit less room than the long wheelbase versions. It's not going to be quite as fast either. The Mercedes is also unquestionably going to be more expensive to insure and repair long term. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and we have been taking a look at the 2016 GMC Yukon and the Yukon Denali. Be sure and click the subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. Click on those related videos over there on the side of your screen, and I'll see you next week. Don't you wish your girlfriend was raw like me? Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like me? Don't you? Mm -mm 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 -mm.